Hello and welcome to our introductory video of St. Teresa of Avila's interior castle. We're so excited to go on this journey with you and I think that we're going to see how suitable this is for a Catholic school because uh, St. Teresa herself testified about how uh, good books changed her life and bad books um, presented obstacles for her path to holiness. So it's really a perfect book to talk about books. And also in the saint's own life, she testified about the impact of beauty and goodness in helping her have that conversion and move towards Christ. So those transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness that our school is all about are really encapsulated in a powerful way in St. Teresa of Avila's book called The Interior Castle. So why Teresa? Why would we even choose her? I want to talk a little bit about her. Of course, she is a doctor of the church. She is a saint. But I do think it's interesting. At the start of the new millennium, John Paul II said there are four doctors that we need to pay attention to. Uh, St. John of the Cross, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Therese of Lisieux, and our friend here for this year, St. Teresa of Avila. And he says we need these four saints to teach us how to have a real prayer life. Because you know what the Pope said. He said, if Catholics don't become mystics, we will not survive at all. We won't stay in the church. We won't stay on the path if we don't learn how to hear Christ in our own hearts. And so I'm hoping this study will help us not be afraid of that word mystic. Now, St. Teresa herself said, when you're actually on that path of prayer and conversion, you cannot do it without friends. You can't do it alone. So hopefully we can all be friends and do this together. Um, in 1970, Pope Paul VI broke new ground by declaring St. Teresa of Avila and St. Catherine of Siena as the first female doctors of the church. So that's not so long ago, um, and so that's exciting to be living during sort of this pioneering age. He, he said women epitomized female contributions to church teaching throughout the centuries. So this is a good time maybe to just review what a doctor of the church is. A doctor of the church helps the church understand the era in which she is living um, right now and then throughout the generations. So recently, Pope Francis has named a few new doctors of the church. Um, and so they have something to say for us right now in our times. And yet, even though that is true, a doctor of the church is not limited to their own period. They have this sort of universal application. They help the church understand herself and her mystery. The word doctor, doctor of the church, it comes from the Latin um, docere, which means to teach. Um, later on, of course, it will mean the highest academic level. Um, also, doctors of the church are known for their writing. Now, we want to remember, we don't believe that means all doctors of the church, or any saints for that matter, are free from error. Of course, they make mistakes, but we can still use their writings to gain a fuller appreciation of the great truths of our faith. And St. Teresa of Avila, she is the doctor of the mystical life. She is the saint to teach us about what it means to have union with our bridegroom, Jesus. And this is, of course, the purpose for which we are born. So she's extremely important. Now, St. Teresa was born in 1515 in Spain. So that evokes so much, doesn't it? Early 16th century Spain. We're looking at her golden age, right? We're thinking um, Columbus had already made those exciting discoveries. Um, we're going to see the great saints like uh, Ignatius of Loyola and John of the Cross. This is the age of the Counter-Reformation. Um, this is going to be eventually the Council of Trent in this century. So we're definitely moving into the modern period. But what's so interesting about Teresa, she's a modern saint. But if you ever had the privilege of visiting Avila, it's a medieval city. And I think it tells us a lot about her. I want to read you something from the scholar Carlos Aire. And this is what he says about Avila. He says, symmetrical Avila mocks the landscape that surrounds it. 
so given to extremes of stifling heat and bitter cold, so implacably parched and vast and empty, so devoid of visible boundaries, so softly bereft of straight lines, obtuse angles, curves, and all the precise order that humans can impose on the world. And that is so true. When you go to Avila, it's so medieval. There are beautiful medieval walls around it. Um, and, you know, I just want to speak p- from personal experience about my visit to Avila. Um, my husband did a lot of research in Spain. And honestly, when I was in my 20s, I did not like St. Teresa's writings and I didn't want to go to Avila, Um, but my husband forced me. And actually, when I visited her convent, I, I truly had such a conversion just from walking in. When I saw all the keys of her, um, of of her founding of her convents i saw the little bed that she slept in all of a sudden i just had this vision of how i had one foot in the world and one foot in the church and i had not really made the decision to fully follow christ so i had a tremendous conversion when i was 29 and i visited avila and i have since been back there a few times because um, she's just had such a big influence on my life and that's what we see in Teresa's life she had dramatic moments of encounter with Christ that I'd like to tell you about as I said she was born in 1515 she died in 1582 as a child Um, she had two things going on. On the one hand, she could be quite shallow, but she also had a heart for God. I'm sure you've heard the favorite story that she and her brother uh, ran away from home looking for martyrdom. So she had a big heart for, for God. Now her mother died, and I've read accounts that said she was 11, she was 13, she was 14. Maybe we should just say 12. But when she was young, her mother died, and this had a, a very big impact on her and, of course, on her father, who eventually did remarry um she we do know she took our lady to be her mother but she does the saint does write about what losing her mother did for her in good ways and in bad ways I, i guess i don't mean good ways but um how it led her closer to our lady but how she got off track a little bit she does talk about um the bad influence of a cousin um this cousin brought her bad books and helped her to make some bad decisions. Um, And so again, this is a saint who's really concerned about giving the right books into uh, the hands of young people. She uh, was, I believe, the fifth oldest of 12 kids. So there was a lot of kids there. Eventually, she was educated by Augustinian nuns, but she got very, very sick. Um, And so she became so ill, she had to leave there. And she stayed um, with an uncle. And this uncle had prayerful books. And it was actually these good books that changed her life. Makes us think of St. Ignatius of Loyola, right? He always said he read those bad books, those chivalric romances, and then later read good books that changed his life. So he had good books. And she's going to stay with this uncle several times in her life. And she found a book called The Spiritual Alphabet by Francisco de Osuna, and that really changed her life um, about the meaning of prayer. So she's very ill. She gets better. Um, And then at age 20, she decides that, you know, she has a vocation to actually be a nun. I think she was very, St. Teresa is nothing if not practical. She was kind of worried about entering into a bad marriage where she would be miserable. I think she was kind of thinking that way. And she decided to enter the easygoing Carmelite monastery um, there. And her father was against that. So she writes about how very difficult it was to leave her father. He wanted her to wait until he died, but she did not wait. She went to this Carmelite, um, monastery and, um, this monastery was lax. It did not follow the original Carmelite rule. And as St. Teresa tells us, it was easy for her to fall into some bad habits, which is just kind of um, a theme running throughout her life. Anyway, she got very sick again uh, when she was in that convent. 
she has to leave. Um, and yes, she starts to practice prayer again um, more seriously. She does return to the convent. They actually thought she died. They even put the pennies on her eyes. So she's very weakened. But she does go back to the convent. And she had already tasted a real prayer life. But according to her own writings, her illnesses, her frequent illnesses, led her to make, I guess, some lazy decisions. She became lax in prayer once again and gave up prayer altogether. Now, remember, it's really important to define our terms. Uh, Teresa's a nun, so she's doing vocal prayer 24-7, right? She prayed all the time. When she says she's giving up prayer, she means she's giving up mental prayer. <coughs> When we talk about mental prayer, we're talking about the interior life. So she had that and she gave it up and no longer practiced mental prayer. Well, one day the, the convent had borrowed a statue for a feast day and it was a statue of the wounded Christ. When she saw that statue, she was completely transformed. She fell at the statue's feet. It was a, a bloody Christ. She just had an interior understanding of what Christ did for her. She vowed at that time to say yes, to give her full yes, her fiat to the Lord. And while that was happening in Spain, this is so exciting, there was a Spanish translation of Augustine's Confessions. Well, when she read Augustine's Confessions, all of a sudden, she projected her own life into that text and into Augustine's conversion. And she thought, you know what? I am following Augustine's life. She also felt like she was following Mary Magdalene's example. And again, we remember the church is built on imitation. In classical schools, we use the word mimesis. But, you know, St. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so in this line of thinking, we have St. Mary Magdalene, St. Augustine, Augustine and St. Teresa of Avila. Quick side note, jump to the 20th century. St. Edith Stein, martyr in the Holocaust, was an atheist. She picked up St. Teresa of Avila's writings and after she read it, she said, this is the truth, I'm converting. So we're following this pattern here of imitation. But notice again, the importance of a good book. It is always a good book that saved Teresa. Could the same be said for you and I? Could a good book put us on the right path? Um, so she said, boy, I'm just like Augustine. And she even imagined herself weeping under that famous fig tree like Augustine did. And she had read, she, when she was younger, these books of chivalry. But she tried to transform herself um, out of these chivalric romances and really to allow herself to have a romance with the Lord. So that will change her life forever. After this, her prayer life really takes off. She is famous for her locutions, her ecstasies. And so all of Spain is astir at this woman because she would literally levitate while she was praying. She was terribly embarrassed about this. Uh, her nuns asked her to write down her experiences, which she did, and they caused a stir. A lot of people were not used to a woman being so bold, writing about her life with Jesus. So she was scandalized many people in her time. In fact, the Inquisition even was after her for a while. Uh, one thing that plagued Teresa for many years, she would could not find a confessor who was as smart as she was or as holy as she was, and they led her down a bad path. They told her her prayer experiences were from evil spirits. This tormented her tremendously. It wasn't until later on when the Jesuits started sending some priests that she finally got a confessor who could understand her. Um, eventually, as you know, she becomes a reformer. She decides to um, start... Uh, building convents that follow the original Carmelite rule, meaning poverty, silence, enclosure. 
Many people loved the idea and many people hated her. She made many enemies for trying to reform the Carmelite order. But she did end up, I think, um, building 17 foundations. And like I said, if you go to Spain, you could see the key for each one. Um, the Carmelites split when she was 65 years old. And, and she had them split. People who would want to go back to the original rule now had the option to do so. She is famous for writing four books. Uh, the Way of Perfection, which she wrote for her nuns. Her Foundations, which she also wrote for her nuns. Her Vida, or Life in English, that's her autobiography, which is really a delightful read. And then her mystical classic that we're going to read, The Interior Castle. And um, all of these books emphasize, I guess we could say, three themes. The necessity of prayer, the way to actually practice prayer, and the nature of the fruits of prayer. And I just kind of wanted to do a quick, so just a little theology lesson. If you look at all of the doctors of the church, they and we kind of condense what they say, they agree that souls on the journey to Christ have three conversions. And a lot of scholars try to put the interior castle in alignment with the three conversions. And I think it can be helpful as long as we um, give ourselves room for um, individual experience. So the first conversion is called the purgative stage. This is where a soul has moved out of mortal sin um, and has a stable life with the sacraments and has voluntarily given up things for Christ, like, um, you know, maybe giving up television, fasting, changing your friends, changing uh, maybe your clothes. That's the purgative aspect. The next stage is called the illuminative stage. And this is where the soul is starting to go deeper in prayer and receive the secrets of the kingdom. There's illumination. There is stability. And then the last uh, part of the journey is called the unitive stage. And this is where the soul enters the unitive way. And if a soul does not have the courage to do it now, the soul will have more time in purgatory. Because the unitive way is the betrothal and the marriage. And those are two separate events. Every baptized soul is called to the unitive way. It's not just for priests and nuns and a few saints. Every soul is. So the unitive way, when a soul enters the unitive way, it is uh, full of suffering. Now, the, um, the transformation that happens in the soul, it's not that the person does the thinking about it. It just happens. Instead of active penance, we call them passive penance purgations. This is where the soul is persecuted, or the soul is sick, or the soul goes through a period of loss. And all these things happen um, outside of the person's control. And that means the person is entering into the unitive way. And there's, like I said, a betrothal, and then later on, um, a marriage. And I believe St. Teresa taught you could have about 10 years between each of those. But again, every soul is different. And some souls do go backwards and it's too hard for them. So anyway, those are the three conversions. And what people like to do sometimes is see how those three conversions fit into the seven mansions. So let's go back and look at our interior castle. According to St. Teresa, um, the, there is a structure of a castle with seven rooms, and she says that is the image of the soul and the interior life. She simultaneously introduces the symbol of the silkworm, reborn as a butterfly, in order to express the passage from the natural to the supernatural. She mainly draws inspiration from sacred scripture, especially the Song of Songs, because the final symbol, this seventh mansion, is the symbol of the bride and the bridegroom. And this is the four crowning aspects of the uh, Christian life. And Pope Benedict 
the 16th, who we just lost recently. According to him, St. Teresa's vision culminates in these four crowning aspects of the Christian life, which are the Trinitarian, the Christological, the Anthropological, and the Ecclesial. And we'll unpack those, but those are four fancy ways of saying the Trinity, Christ himself, um, the human being, and the church dimension. So according to Pope Benedict, this work is really full of those four concepts, okay? And as you read, you're going to see that St. Teresa, she's full of um, wit imagination. She's very busy while she's writing this. So it's, it's really interesting to um, read it along with her. Um, after St. Teresa of Avila died, just kind of a side note, her body was um, transferred to Avila. And in her day, she was a very beautiful woman. Um, and so people were fighting over her body. Apparently, she had very beautiful feet. And the nuns there wanted her body. So they ended up cutting up her body. But I did want to say her heart, um, and I've seen it at Alba de Tormes, um, her heart has, you've probably seen the artwork. Um, St. Teresa experienced what we call the transverberation. Um, this is a very controversial, famous event, but she writes about it. She says that she saw um, an angel, a seraphic angel with a long... Um, arrow and the tip of the arrow is on fire and the angel plunged it into her heart and as the angel pulled it out of her heart she could barely breathe and she described it as painful and beautiful at the same time so when they um, dug up her body her actual heart has scientific um, these wounds of the transverberation and it's really amazing when you read about it um, and you probably know the famous Bernini statue um, where artists have tried for centuries to depict this bewildering scene but I think it's a perfect way for us to enter this study because Teresa is a heart wounded by love she is wounded by the love of her savior and that really does correspond to the writings in the Song of Songs. Um, she was beatified in 1614. She was canonized in 1622. Because of the way the calendars changed, her feast day ends up being on October uh, the 15th. Um, and so I, I think this is a good way for us to Think about even buying our copy of The Interior Castle. So my homework for you is, have you bought your copy of the book? And I think all of us should ask ourselves this question. Do I have an interior life? I think that's the question this doctor of the church would like for us to begin with. Do I have an interior life? Because that was the question that shocked me when I visited her convent in Spain because I realized my prayer life was quite shallow. Um, when I came home, I changed my alarm clock and it's actually never been the same. I get up a lot earlier every day to make time for prayer because I know um, how life can get and then I won't make time. So I definitely made changes in my own life back then uh, when I was 29. So um, I'm going to ask myself the same question again. Do we have an interior life? And if you're interested in that, join us next time and we will look at our introduction to the first room in our own interior castle.